So we'll get started. Um, I think because we're the last session, um, we only get an hour, so we have to. Um, we don't get the extra 15 minutes, so we'll try and keep it moving along. Um, we're here to talk about MLATs today. Um, woo! Yeah. <laughs> Preach up. So I think if you'd said that a year ago, um, the reaction would have been quite different. Actually, in any other room, it probably would have been different without Del. Um, <laughs> um, but I think on the one hand, it's um, the Snowden's revelations really, you can say they uh, um very little relevance to um, MLATs, um, the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaties, because they really are the formal treaty process that only deal with um, criminal investigations and prosecutions. But on the other hand, um, they are, as with everything at this conference, there is some relevance, and I think for at least two reasons. The fact that um, you don't really have to start by explaining the importance of um, considering the way in which da um, user data is shared with international governments. Um, and also, I think, secondly, the fact that um, there's a lot more attention, there's some momentum, um, there's interest um, uh, from the President's uh, review group, the President's statement, statements by companies, civil society is becoming more engaged with this. It's and that's having a moment. Um, and I think that <laughs> it is exciting, but it also means that now is an opportunity um, when we talk about the limitations of the current system, um, now is the best opportunity that we'll probably have for a while um, to actually get some traction with any changes. So. Um, now is an excellent time, I think, to be having this discussion, which is about how best to move this discussion forward and to think about reforms or improvements to the systems. Um, so today I wanted to share with you some of the discussions that um, have been going on and that I've been a part of about how to um, improve the system. So yesterday, um, a small number of uh, MLAT nerds um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks Ross. <laughs> uh, we sat around the table and, and had a lively discussion about um, about the state of the system as it is at the moment and ideas about how it could be improved. And today I wanted to share a couple of the ideas and themes that came out of that discussion with you as a slightly broader audience and to seek some more input or comments and just um, explore those ideas a little further. Uh, so. I guess I'll first of all just mention the slide that's up at uh, the top there, and I, that also sort of feeds into Access's role in this. So, um, Access is uh, the project that I've been working with Access on this is to bring that conversation forward on MLATS to create hopefully a more informed discussion. Sometimes for people who are outside of the system, it's very difficult to understand it. Um, and so the quality of the discussion or the publicly available information has been um, lacking. Um, and one of the things that Access has done, we've just sort of a uh, soft launch, I guess, of the first iteration of um, MLAT.info website, where we're, the aim is to collect um, the treaty texts um, and to make generally a repository for information on MLATs. And that's something that we'll be um, looking to collect materials that we all come across. Um, those of us who work on this issue, you come across and you pop them in the folder on your desk and then the next person who needs to find them has to go through exactly the same process. Um, and you'll find on this website there's also a couple of policy um, discussion papers that are put together to capture some of the discussions and thoughts that we've been having about what is actually wrong with the MLAT system and what are ways that we can improve it. So there's a lot of discussion about it being slow, inefficient, it's a 20th century treaty system that um, it really struggles when it comes to the context of online records. Um, and we use that as a bit of a starting point for some of our discussions uh, yesterday when we were talking about the path forward. So I'm kindly joined here by two people who were part of that discussion yesterday. I have Del Harvey from Twitter and Gail Kent from the UK National Crime Agency. And I wanted to just sort of share some of the uh, themes of the discussions that we had. So this, uh, oh dear, it looks like my PowerPoint presentation skills are lacking. But <laughs> this is sort of, we tried to yesterday as part of it. It's one of those things that everybody looks at a different part of the process. And we all think we're talking about the same thing, but sometimes when you drill down to the detail, we actually each have our blind spots or parts that we're missing. And so we actually just mapped out the process there of um, what happens 
in the context of an MLAT request from a foreign country to the US and in particular um, to California for online records um, held by a company that treats California as the jurisdiction. Um, so as you can see there's quite a few steps and it basically, it literally goes all the way, steps through those and all the way back. Um, so there's, there's a level of duplication, it's safe to say. So it starts out with the foreign law enforcement officer and or the foreign prosecutor through the foreign central authority, usually a Department of Justice equivalent. Um, then across to the US central authority, which is the Department of Justice Office of International Affairs. Um, it's then filtered down to the California district attorney, who then filters it down to the FBI, who prepares a search warrant request, um, goes and obtains that from the district court, which is then presented to the company, and then it steps its way all the way back until it eventually finds its way back to the foreign law enforcement um, officer who needs it for an investigation or prosecution. So when we talked about all those steps yesterday, um, a couple of the themes that we did talk about was um, making information about that process better available, particularly for the police officers in various countries who I mean, some of them may deal with these sorts of requests all the time. Others may have never seen one. And to be honest, usually law enforcement officers don't go into law enforcement for the paperwork. And so when you're confronted with a, a process like this, it, it's a little overwhelming. So that's something that um, Gail um, has some experience with and was going to talk um, to that. And then um, Another aspect of the conversation we had was the information flow to uh, the companies and what information um, they have in order to make the decisions um, and respond to these requests and the sorts of challenges from the company perspective there. So those were two of the things that we talked about and then um, after we've sort of canvassed that a little I wanted to open it up for people to uh, react to or provide input to those um, sorts of areas or any questions about that. So, Gail, if I could perhaps hand over to you. Yeah, so my name is Gail Kent. I work for the UK National Crime Agency, which um, sometimes it's a good thing to say that's the UK version of the FBI. Sometimes it might not be a good thing to say. <laughs> um, but what it means is that my day job is investigating organised crime. Uh, we also have the responsibility for child sexual exploitation and drug smuggling, a lot of hopefully the, the big offence is that we all agree that we do have a, a duty to investigate. Um, and 15 years ago when I joined our service, uh, we concentrated on using mobile phone data and landline data to try and um, carry out those investigations. That's changed a huge amount, obviously, in the past 15 years. And, um, about a year ago when I started when I was asked to start looking at the cyber sphere, I realised that this was one of the biggest issues that is um, facing law enforcement nowadays. So instead of, if you use your national process, it might take you days or weeks to get hold of that data. If you use this mutual legal assistance process to get hold of Facebook, Twitter, Google, Yahoo, Microsoft data, it's taken an average of a year. So you can, and that's, that's not just for the UK, that's internationally, assuming that, as Kate said, you know how to use it. So you can imagine the impact that that is having on investigations um, across the world. And those are the sort of investigations that we absolutely want to do, so whether, it is, uh, whether it's looking at somebody who is um, involved in, in bullying and sort of exploitation of somebody who put images of themselves on the internet, or whether it is looking at, um, especially looking at the sort of cyber criminals that I focus on now who are stealing mass amounts of, of data as it has a huge impact. So um, about six months ago I thought it would be a great idea to come to Stanford and become an uber MLAT nerd and um, spend six months trying to examine why is this such a big problem and what exactly can we do um, around trying to, trying to, to solve the problem. I bumped into some other MLAT nerds, some of them were around the, around the street. Um, and one of the, you know, undoubtedly one of the biggest um, issues is the lack of information that there is um, on how to get this data. Um, most law enforcement officers, um, rightly or wrongly, and you can, um, there's a debate to be had on this issue, believe that you can use your own national legislation to get hold of, of communications data that is held by international providers. Um, so they might start going down that route and then 
find that actually, you know, guess what, Microsoft doesn't have an office in their capital. Um, and so that that's, that's not the way to get it. They may even try and phone up the local office or find a phone number on the internet, see if they can get it that way. Um, uh, might go through the American Embassy or they might try their, their embassy in the US. Um, and there just is, there is no clarity at, um, at that basic investigator level of how you go about obtaining data. Um, and I, I know that for a fact because I, I work very closely with Interpol and I've done a survey of in 190 countries about how do you obtain this data and I asked them how, you know, what is the process that you go through, how do you decide? And there are people that have tech random choice. So they, you know, they, there is that it's complete lack of understanding about, uh, about the fact that this process exists um, and how you go and how you should go about using it. So one of the, the issues that we talked about yesterday was having some, some very clear guidance that is available, not just for law enforcement officers, but I think also to internet users, to governments, to, to the companies about what is the process that you go through in order um, to, to obtain data. And you know, companies, and, and particularly in, um, the big five companies, have done a lot of work on, on what information is available to, to government, and that, that, is, that is available um, online. But to get into that level of detail, if you're an investigator on the street and wanting something quickly, can be, can be very difficult. So I think that, um, that one of the things that certainly that we discussed yesterday that would be incredibly useful um, as part of transparency for law enforcement, but also transparency for all internet users, is greater clarity on, on how you do obtain data that is held um, primarily by, by US providers. And with that, um, with that resource, that amount of information, I think the other thing that we can be doing more of um, as a community of stakeholders, so that's law enforcement, governments, and the companies themselves, as well as people like Access, is, is more training um, on how exactly we can get that. And part of that information and training also needs to include um, information on what are the what are the thresholds that people have to meet to obtain um, to obtain the information through mutual legal assistance, um, because there are there are countries around the world where there is. Um, there is a belief that any crime has to be investigated, so that includes somebody stealing a small amount of money or making what would just be deemed as a sort of throwaway remark on, on Twitter, and we need to have better understanding of that. Um, but we can't be clogging up systems, asking for requests along those lines. Equally, we also need to, to understand um, that we have to be, that if we're going to put in requests, that they need to not be um, against offences that are politically motivated or that have racial or, or other elements to them. And I think there's also some quite clear guidelines and treatment that, that come along with that, as well as more information on how we use mutual legal systems to obtain this data. I'm tempted to ask you questions now, but maybe I'll <laughs> abide by my own rules and I'll um, hand over to Dell for you to um, share about your perspective and then we'll have a broader um, opportunity for questions and discussion. Sure thing. So I'm Del Harvey. I'm from Twitter where I head up Trust and Safety, which is a remarkably vague name, but it's essentially the legal policy areas and it includes things like legal ads policies and government requests for user information or to withhold content, all that sort of stuff. So whereas Gail is coming at this graph from sort of the, the foreign law enforcement box, I'm at the exact opposite side of it as, as the company box, which it's always nice to fit into a box, isn't it? <laughs> there isn't an NGO box on here, we should probably <laughs> just on the, the side. outside. Just off to the side. <laughs> so one of the things that came up in conversation yesterday in our little and Latin nerds group, if you will, was that for companies, by the time we see the MLAT, A, a significant chunk of time has generally passed from whenever the ish issue or incident happened that led to the MLAT process being kicked off, and B, all of the information that Gail or her coworkers had painfully and painstakingly put into the actual original request, huge chunks of it have been removed. 
In fact, we don't always even know if what we're looking at is an MLAT. It's really a, you know, that they leave a cover sheet on it that says this is an MLAT. And when you're down to it being a case, the chance of, you know, did they leave the cover sheet on when they faxed it over? Like, that's a weird place to try to track metrics, right? Like, cover sheets are not an accurate measurement for anybody. Most people, at least. So, what we discussed was, you know, there was at first this question of, look, if it's gone through not only the foreign law enforcement process, right, it's gone up through their judicial body, and then it came over to the United States, and it's gone through their judicial process, why do you guys even want to know more about this? Like, this is a request, it's made it through all, it's made it through two rounds, just process it and be done. And we were like, so we don't really like that as a general rule. Like, there's not really anything that we just process and be done, right? Because there's a challenge around context where we may feel as though we have additional information. Say that we know that a request is coming from country X, and we also received a communication from country X around the time that the process got kicked off that made us question whether or not they were, in fact, asking about this because of what they were saying. You know, oh, well, this is a very serious crime and it's, you know, money laundering or, it's, you know, it's money laundering followed by extortion and they killed a man. Like something, you know, super gratuitous, right? And we're like, that, that's weird because this is just a parody account of one of the ministers. <laughs> I mean, that just seems a little off. I, I, you know, we just want to see a little more information and in that process gets kicked off and maybe we see, you know, months later something handed to us that says, you know, here's Warren, let's go. Basic subscriber info. We're like, you know, this name looks familiar. <laughs> there isn't a cover sheet that says Inlab, that's really no guarantees. So then we have to go back, we actually, you know, like to add even more steps to this process and be like, so guys, did you mean it? when you said that you thought this was a thing, because we think this might not be a thing, and it's a, like a lot of phone calls that people, thankfully not me, but people in my department have to make, because <laughs> I avoid the phone like the Dickens. Uh, but, you know, it's this, it's this super complex process, which then can slow things down even more, when in the vast majority of cases, the law enforcement agency would be perfectly fine with us having that additional information. They weren't trying to do some underhanded thing. They just, it just got stripped out somewhere along the path. So we're slowing down the process by trying to make sure that the process is right, and that is probably the right thing to do at the moment, because going hell-bent for leather in terms of turning over user information is not something that anyone is espousing. But it's something where longer term, it makes it a challenge for MLAT to actually be the answer on how you deal with multi-jurisdictional issues, which is problematic in and of itself. So suffice it to say we didn't actually solve the MLAT problem yesterday, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but we did find out that there were a couple of points where just education and outreach, in terms of education and outreach for law enforcement, in terms of talking to the folks that you know, DOJ, OIA, like, hey, do you really need to strip out all that information? Could you maybe leave some of it in, like, the country this is coming from, even? Like, just having some of those conversations and not tackling the challenge of, let's change how treaties work, because that would take a lot longer, but just the smaller things where you're like, this might have just happened because somebody thought it was a good idea, and it's not actually in law anywhere, and they thought they were making it easier. Like, trying to find that low hanging fruit and make those fixes and start making adjustments to even just the small trajectories of what we're doing while we're also still going after the bigger reforms. Um, I guess something that I find interesting on both of those issues, and maybe I'll start kick off some questions on that front, is it seems to me there's a lot of questions about information management and also who should have which pieces of information. And I think it has um, historically, I think my background is um, how I came to be working with MLATS, was originally I worked for um, the federal government in Australia, um, making, um, helping police officers and prosecutors to make 
um, these requests. So I guess my box is the second one, uh, Foreign Central Authority, and then I moved outside of the boxes uh, <laughs> um, into the civil society. But I think it has, you know, the people who are within the boxes get their own little bits of information, but anybody, like, it's difficult to see the information that the other boxes have, and if you're outside of the boxes, you, you don't even realise that there's the boxes going on, maybe. Um, Sometimes if you're in the boxes. <laughs> That's yeah, right. You, don't, you also don't understand at what point where it's got to in that, like, there's no way of monitoring. That's right, that's right. We, we, don't, we don't know where we all stand. Um, <laughs> but so I'm interested and I've also noticed so on the, the subject that Gail talked about with providing more information to law enforcement officers, it seems there's been a bit of a change. You know, a few years ago, um, you could not find law enforcement guide, guidance um, for companies online. And that was sort of a, you know, when people leaked that, that was an issue. Um, and now um, you can find a lot more information about that. But my question to you, Gail, is do you think um, do you think there is a danger in people sort of being able to have more information about how the police officers can access this? Because that seemed to be sort of maybe where the, you know it came from. We needed to guard this information. Or, um, I mean, I guess it seems, you know, it'd be like, no, of course more information is useful, but are there valid sort of how much information that when you say provide outreach to those law enforcement officers and things, is that something that really needs to be carefully sort of, no, it's not appropriate for that operational sorts of things to be out there more broadly, or is there quite a bit of information that can be shared? Um, I think first thing, this isn't, is, it shouldn't be a secret that we can obtain this information through judicial uh, process, uh, because the point of the investigations that I'm doing, um, is to have someone up in court and to prosecute them, often using the information that we have uh, uh, that we've obtained. So that that absolutely shouldn't be a secret, and this is not part of um, this is not how you gather the de how, how you gather um, information by carrying out surveillance on someone's house. You're you're not giving away any of those secrets. Um, and I think the thing that it, for me that is um, are two things that are very frustrating is that the information is there in different parts and I spent six months trying to pull it together so you can get the Department of Justice um, CSIPS guide on filling in different parts of it uh, and at the back of it there is what information you need for a court order or even for a subpoena so it is there. Equally um, the law enforcement guidelines that are created for the different companies um, and they all differ slightly give a huge amount of information on what you need to do if you're a US law enforcement entity and then there is a couple of lines about what you need to do if you are uh, working internationally. Um, and that contrasts you know, greatly with um, the training that is taking place that we all get, you know, all law enforcement gets and using our own legislation to obtain data. So I've, I've just looked at the, the stats and 68% of countries provide training on the national processes for getting communication data um, compared to 32 who provide it for obtaining it internationally. So it's not a surprise that we don't have that level of knowledge. So I, I don't think, you know, to answer your question briefly, I think more information, um, concise information is good. And I guess my follow-up question on the information angle for Dell would be, um, so it, you're sort of effectively, when we're talking about you want more information about where this has come from, you're wanting information outside of your box. Um, does that create risks or liabilities for you though? And then I guess, um, so there's, there's a range of different ways in which you can access data. MLAT is one of them, the, probably the slowest and most formal way in which to do it. There are other informal ways in which um, law enforcement can directly ask from the companies or um, police officers in one country can share data with, um, with police officers here, um, but if it's come through the MLAT process or, or the other, are you creating then um, the responsibility is not just the government but it becomes the companies as well, is that, is that changing your liability do you think, um, and not necessarily from a legal liability but sort of a moral culpability perhaps, or is it just reflecting a responsibility you already feel, or does that change it if you have more information? I mean, I would say it actually just reflects what we already feel. There's not any type of request that we just 
say, okay, we got this request and it came through this channel, go. So even something that is, even if it's a situation where, say it's a law enforcement agency contacting us about a situation that involves imminent danger, so there's this sort of workaround for law enforcement where if somebody, for example, tweets something saying, I've just taken this bottle of pills, I can't handle this anymore, goodbye, that they're not going, all right, well, let's kick off the MLAT process, and in a year, we'll get this information. Like, this does no good, right? So there is a process where they can say, look, somebody is in imminent danger. It could be somebody who's threatening self-harm. It could be somebody who says, I've just strapped this bomb to my chest, and I'm going to this address in this location. Now, even for those, we actually don't have one person who could say, yes, we will, we will disclose this data. We still will actually take the request, we'll look at the tweet or tweets that they're reporting. If we don't see what they're talking about, or if it looks like, you know, if somebody's like, oh my god, school went terribly today, I wish I could just blow it up. No, no, that's not a, like, that's where we go back and we're like, so guys, I think this is hyperbole. And there's, you know, we, we, we take it pretty seriously for any type of request. We need to have an understanding of what's going on because we do feel that responsibility. 77% of our users are outside of the United States, which means that there's a, a pretty good likelihood that requests could be coming from outside of the United States. That's only going to grow. And if we push back on requests that we get from the United States, like you can look at our transparency reports and see that we say no in the United States pretty regularly, it would only be expected that we would also want to have the context and the additional information outside of the United States as well. And I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a liability. I think that's a responsibility. And I think that that, that possibility actually lets us be more responsible sort of participants in this graph slash people outside the boxes slash world that we are in because everything is so often multi-jurisdictional and multinational that we have to be conscious of that. So we talked a bit yesterday about how it works in the financial world um, and uh, I have a team in London that also looks at money laundering and for me it is very strange that they can phone up the bank and have a conversation um, about whether it's worth putting in for a new case called a production order. Um, and part of that conversation is just as you say, Del, that you're part of a participant and whether it's useful, whether you know what is going to come of that, does the account even exist? Um, and I think, you know, from, from my perspective, it would be very useful to be able to have that, that conversation in advance of the MLAT process as part of it, rather than it just being that you, know, you get to Gail, not even Gail Kent, the UK wants this Or just not even the UK. Sometimes it's just like, somebody wants this yeah. information, right? So, and in terms of, like, Twitter is, I will say that Twitter is in a very different position than many other companies in this respect, in that the majority of content on our platform is public. You can see if an account exists by typing it in, right? Like, yeah. it's pretty straightforward to go and see if somebody has added that username or not. For the most part, you can look at their tweets. Like, we don't have a lot of information about our users, so it's a very different situation than some of the other sort of folks that are, that are often cited as being in the industry, which is a very wide-ranging array of people and companies. So, to some degree, you know, I don't want to oversimplify the challenge of them getting additional information or being able to provide additional guidance. But for us, the more that we can educate law enforcement that, look, if we know all this information from the outset, we're going to be able to handle this and turn it around exponentially faster, the more we benefit from them then following up with that, oh, here's the request, oh, and here's the context as to why and what law and, you know, under what authority and all those sorts of things that you kind of want to know when somebody says, give me this information that you are also required by law to keep private and secure. So the more that we can get that message out there, I think really for every company, the better off, even if we can't 
kick it off by having this sort of unofficial conversation of, you know, can we even go ahead, like, is it worth doing this? We can at least make it really clear, look, this is what you'll get if you do this. This is the most you'll get. You can't get, like, this isn't, we don't even have that. Like, I, I have had, I have seen requests from law enforcement to Twitter where they're like, and what's the, what's the, uh, what's the address, the home address for the account? We're like, uh, <laughs> like, a street? <laughs> and they literally mean they want the physical address, and we're like, so that's, I mean, really no idea, guys. And it, but, it, but when there's that much confusion, and it's, it's, when Twitter has actually been around for a while, quote unquote, in tech years, you know, it's been like, what, eight years now, something like that? But when you think about all the other platforms that are popping up, really, really quickly, you know, it's Whisper, it's Snapchat, it's it's uh, secret, it's this, it's that, it's, I mean, how are you going to ever keep track unless there's something that says, look, here's a rough outline of the expectations, and here's a rough outline of what you should expect back, and if you've done all these things, then here's a way to follow, follow the bouncing ball through the path and know where it is. Is it still stuck in your own country's prosecutorial branch as they're doing some sort of review or has it even gone to the DOJ or OIA? Like, sort of just this more information because people feel a lot better when they have a rough idea of what's going on and when they know what to expect. I won't pop the questions anymore because I know we have some people in here with um, a lot more experience than I on particular issues um, and might want to ask some questions about those. Um, so, And if anybody's solved, the problem. Just, just go ahead. <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> we'll head out for a drink in the meantime. Yeah. Just if it's already done. Um, well, thanks very much. It's been really helpful. Um, I've been an MLAT nerd for a really long time. I, I, I think we should get a t-shirt or something together. Um, <laughs> I'm with Adobe Systems, but I used to oversee international enforcement at Yahoo quite a long time ago, um, very early on in the internet. And um, my job for almost seven years was traveling around the world being yelled at by international law enforcement agencies who were threatening to imprison our local general managers and the like um, for not having the ability to turn over data for Yahoo users whose data was hosted in the United States. And um, I guess I've got two questions from that experience. One is, um, you know, we actually prepared all kinds of education materials based on the jurisdiction to teach about the MLAT process and who you go to and you know, what the process is, but we took a very hard line position that we wouldn't turn over data absent going through MLAT. We didn't make exceptions except in the imminent harm situation. Um, and one challenge that we found was that a number of companies um, would voluntarily turn over data. They'd say, well, just serve your local legal process on us, and um, we don't take the position on a legal obligation to turn it over, but we'll do it voluntarily. And that put us in a fairly difficult position taking a hard line um, stance on behalf of our users, so that and so I guess I'm curious, A, Del, whether you guys run into that same sort of problem between the safety of your international users and um, differing standards between companies. And then second, I'm wondering if anybody has any idea, the one thing that I've just never seen, because um, I've been yelled at a lot about how inefficient the MLAT process is, but I've never seen anything showing sort of how long typically you know, what's a standard period of time for someone to get through that process? And which types of process are more likely to get through that quickly as opposed to get lost in the shuffle somewhere because they're about a credit card and so She's got like eight that. appendices yeah. and... <laughs> and I, I would love to see that, but I'd be curious to hear about your experience internationally, Del. Thanks. I'll just mention there's also, even I think it was in the President's Review Group, that the, the estimate that they gave for the average was 10 months um, for an online um, records request through MLAT. So obviously, um, at the moment, that's, that's not really terribly useful in an investigation. Um, <laughs> but I'll uh, done. Yeah. So the answer for us is that it really sort of depends on the jurisdiction, on the country, on the process in that country. For the most part, we're, you know, our, our servers are, you know, for the most part in the United States, like our data is here, but we do have a global presence, right? We have offices in multiple other countries, and one of the calculations that I think every business has to do, especially sort of in this day and age, is, okay, 
for this country, for this type of process, do we want to tell them to go through MLAT and have it take 10 months, and that it will be too late for their investigation, or do we believe that there is enough judiciary oversight, there is enough sort of process in place that will still subject it to the same evaluation that we would if it came through normal US channels, are there certain instances where we will say, okay, well, you know, go, go in lab, but let's also look at this sort of side channel. And I think that it's a balancing act for the most part because there are certain countries where we, I mean, we're, we do require the MLAT for the vast majority of countries. There are countries that we have exceptions based upon severity of the like, crime involved and sort of the oversight, the judiciary oversight. Uh, and I think that it's, I think you're often going to find that when companies, especially if they have international headquarters, and this is not, we have an international headquarter in Dublin, but we haven't transferred the user data to, to Dublin per se, but for other companies that have made those user data transfers, they're subject to handling that user data in those jurisdictions under the, the jurisdiction's laws. So for a lot of it, it depends, are you just, a, like, is the majority of your operations in the United States, do you have a footprint outside the United States, where do you have a footprint? Can you change where you have a footprint if you're in certain jurisdictions where you really don't want to turn over data? Like, those are all, I think, things that companies as a whole have to take into consideration. In terms of our approach, it has historically been you know, use MLAT, and we're just starting to look at certain countries where, okay, in this country, in these, if these criteria are met, and there's this process in place, and that's, you know, sort of UK, that kind of thing, then we'll start looking at it. But again, it has to be, it has to go through the same scrutiny, it has to meet with the same criteria, and they're still having to follow the same process that they normally would, minus the 10 months. So that's the case, right. whether the data is stored in the UK or stored in the United States? Yes. Okay. Um, like, to answer the, the first question about um, taking, the state, taking the stance on MLA always having to be used, um, for me that's like, if I look at long-term solutions, we have to get away from that. Um, because for me, as a um, understanding our legislation and knowing what I have to go through to get communications data in the UK, um, knowing how robust that process is, um, for me it's, it's very, um, very frustrating that I can't use that robust legal process to get data that happens to be held by a company that's incorporated in California. You know, there is no um, uh, mutual legal assistance was set up because it was mutually beneficial um, to both countries to, sh to, to go through that process. And that absolutely makes sense if you are wanting a witness interviewed in a different country, if you're wanting to freeze money or, or seize assets that are heard in that country because there is a mutual benefit in that. And it was created to support extradition where getting one person from one country to another was in the benefit of both. Um, I would say, and you know, there is not universal agreement on this, but there is no mutual benefit um, on the case-by-case -case basis of a lot of these requests, because I'm investigating somebody who's in the UK and um, who's got no impact on the, you know, who's committing a crime in the UK, um, and the fact that Yahoo yeah, or Google or Twitter is in the US is, is, is incidental. But I, guess, but I have a yes. question about that. So, I mean, for example, I mean, I'm curious about like how banking crime would be. So, if if you had a claim, you know, you a UK citizen is involved. You know that they're the one citizen involved in the crime, but they stored the funds in a U.S. bank. You wouldn't be able to disgorge the money from that bank with U.S. process, yeah. would you, or could you? Yeah. So, um, so banking is a, is, a, is a good analogy. Um, yeah. So there are systems, there's the, the Financial Action Task Force and the Egmont system that enable you to get that information quickly. Um, and, there, uh, and you can also use Interpol as well. There are a variety of government channels that you can get that information much quicker as information or intelligence. And then you can follow up on, the, um, uh, on actually seizing the assets 
through mutual legal assistance. So there, there, is, there, there are the formal and informal channels that go with it. And so you to yeah, I just wanted to add a, a quick clarification, which is that for us to obviously a component of any process is determining jurisdiction, and this is yeah. I make this point based upon her comment that it has to be a UK citizen. That's if we're looking at some a request and it's not a UK citizen, it's not within their jurisdiction. Even if it's coming in through the UK, that's not going to be something like that's not going to fall within their jurisdiction. So that's not going to meet their criteria. Mm -hmm. So. Similarly, with banking, that's why when it gets to the asset seizure, it goes through the longer process, but the sort of initial bit can go through the shorter, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to steal it back off yeah. you again. <laughs> See, um, I quickly wanted to note, acknowledging your, your point about MLAT is not the solution for everything. Um, I think there needs to be, it's a, a couple of different um, strategies that need to be happening. Um, when the system is so slow and so difficult that um, people interpret go through MLAT as basically meaning no, then that's not a good outcome. So I think that it needs to be improved. The system as it is needs to be um, got to the best that it can be. But acknowledging that there will be, there are circumstances in which it perhaps should also, there are other avenues, but bringing more discussion and more light and more sort of transparency or processes yes. to that. Um, but I wanted to um, open the room again and also the answers don't just have to come. I know we've got a lot of um, um, amazing experience in the room as well, so feel free to pipe up with an answer. Do we have any? Because otherwise Gail, Del, and I will just keep yeah, we'll chatting. Just keep going, I'll be terrible. We do that. <laughs> so to the ad bar, <laughs> deciding whether or not to, I guess this is more to you, whether to abide by MLAT or being open to alternative processes. How does that work from a due process perspective and from challenging requests? I mean, it's just admitting oh, the super problematic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> admitting the problem like we've got a company put in the middle of, you know, an investigation of a citizen, so already there is a disconnect there. But I, I do get worried when Companies are just making decisions, and I also understand um, the need for a potentially streamlined process for at least preliminary information. So, just curious what the thought process is there, and kind of a long-term thinking about that because I I find that makes me that makes my stomach tighten a little bit. And well, it should. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if there's anyone who wanted to particularly answer that one. I got, I got an answer. answer. <laughs> 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 throw it to, to Jeremy. <laughs> well, first of all, it's complicated. <laughs> um, and I think, as you said, it's, it's a matter of, we don't want to be put in that position either, right? And so the prelim preliminary answer is MLAT. Now, we've made a decision based on a variety of, of uh, strategic and practical realizations, right, that a crime of a particular, particularly serious nature that would take 10 months uh, or longer to come through channels to, to us, um, there are circumstances in which we think that it's morally correct uh, and legally uh, sufficient for us to provide basic information, right? So to, to kind of alleviate some of the concerns, this would like exclusively basically be basic information on an account. Um, I can't speak for, for other companies. Um, as Del noted, we have very little information, uh, which is often part of the initial conversation with law enforcement, which is you will likely be better off pursuing an alternative channel, telco, email mm -hmm. provider, uh, and that sort. Um, but going to your point, it's a really complicated challenge. Um, we share your uh, concern, and it's, it's incredibly important to us, right? To oh. your due process question, um, we, by default, every request that comes into us uh, will result in user notice unless there's a legal prohibition. Um, and so we weigh all of these things, as Del uh, noted, and kind of every request, it sort of, it matters where it came from and what it's about, but ultimately we have these very strict guidelines that we follow every single time. Um, and a request like that could start off with us thinking that a voluntary disclosure is the right form of assistance can 
ultimately end up with us pushing back and saying, you know what, we don't have the context necessary, so you're going to have to proceed through MLAB and, and figure out that you know, we, we can then rely on the system that our two governments have agreed upon. I can make you feel better in that as well. As somebody that regularly makes requests, it, we often, they more often than not force us to do it not through the voluntary channel, but through <laughs> the UK. Um, and I think that you, so, and I can also tell you from speaking to all the, the major California providers that, um, that Twitter is not alone in that. Um, and I don't know anybody um, that will provide anything more than basic information on a voluntary basis. Um, I think you can also, like, to be honest, like Dale's touching on it there, you can guess, uh, Jeremy, what, what the criteria are for, for voluntary disclosure, and they're usually, they're not usually, they're always, you've got to have gone through a legal process, it has to be a serious crime, um, it has to have the, the jurisdiction element. Um, I think it would be very helpful um, for, there to be, for, for that to be explicit, so that law enforcement and you, know, you know that what are the circumstances in which information will be provided on a voluntary basis rather than having to go through the right one. And then the challenges begin when per country A, here's the criteria, for country B, the answer is in Latin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No matter what. Have to accept. Which, it's a really awkward help page. Looking <laughs> <laughs> at it, here's your explicit instructions, you and Latin. <laughs> and here's your link, the instructions, we can't even talk to you, <laughs> right? So it's, yeah. it, that's kind of a challenge in and of itself, and it's something that I think often gets flagged as like, oh, this is you guys not being transparent about this, and it's totally not that. It's more just, look, we don't want to actually confuse the issue more by putting people in some countries under the impression that this will totally work when it totally won't. So it's this really bizarrely complex process that, and then the last thing you want to do is send out like an email where you're like, oh, here's the process for now, because then somebody prints it out of tapes to their desk, and five years later they're still trying to use that process when we deprecated it, you know, four and a half years ago. So it's just this really just massive challenge of trying to get information out to the people who need it and to the users. And that's why one of the things that, as Jeremy mentioned, that we really push on is user notice because we want to make sure that our users know if someone is requesting their information and why and how, give them a chance to push often, back. How often can you provide notice in a Do we have, do we have a percentage on the um, glass transparency report? For the United States, it's less than 20%. Uh, but that, that's a comprehensive number and includes um, requests that come in invalidly, like they are identifying an account that doesn't exist. So the so number is a little bit um, not directly to scale, but uh, we tooth and nail every single request that comes in. Our response law enforcement help us understand why we can't provide this. Uh, and there's, I mean, there's agencies that understand that we will just provide, and they are okay with that. You know, it's it's. But we want to understand why we should. We ask a lot of why questions. We're like two-year-olds. Why? <laughs> why can't we? Uh, I'm gonna press the bell channel because, and then uh, yeah, I have to just one quick follow-up, which is, um, I mean, I guess I'm a little uncomfortable with the voluntary disclosure issue too, because it feels to me. I mean, I understand that the MLAP process is broken, and I've been yelled at about it a lot, um, and. My response typically has been, I know it's broken, it's a shame that it's broken, but you are two grown-up governments that have negotiated something amongst yourselves. And if you have a problem with it, negotiate with one another to fix it. Private industry shouldn't be solving the problem through back channels. And it sort of feels like that's what's been happening. Um, and companies handle it inconsistently. I and think companies are quite consistent, to be honest. They are. <laughs> They are, but the problem is, is it puts the company in a position where if somebody misrepresents the reason why they're seeking the data or the severity of the crime, then it's on the company. They did a voluntary disclosure and something goes wrong. You're kind of left hanging in the wind. And so I really, I mean, I understand that the process is broken, but I'd love to see it addressed government to government the way Mom treaties Gail. typically are. I think, there, I think there, are two, there are two issues. There's one, the process is broken, and yes, absolutely, you know, um, we need to fix it, and I think there are a lot of things that we can do. I think the second issue that we that you that I have at the forefront of my mind is actual investigations. At the moment, 
Um, the teams that are looking at cybercrime in the UK are will focus on investigations. So, so we will set, we we select investigations on cybercrime that we can do jointly with the US, um, because that's that means we don't need to go through the MLAT process. Is that correct? That we're not looking at cyber criminals who have more impact, perhaps, on the UK. So the people that are hacking into our companies and they're stealing our citizens' data, you guys have had the target and um, uh, all the data stolen by, by customers at Target. We have the same problems. Should we not be able to target those people quickly? So target. Should we not be able to, um, to 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 investigate those people quickly by getting information on a Gmail account or a Yahoo account? Um, where it's entirely legitimate, we're asking for the basic data, are these people in the UK, what's the IP address? Rather than having to wait 10 months and or prioritising investigations that are possibly not the ones that we need to investigate. And I think that is, you know, that's cyber crime. You know, should be for cyber bullying, where it is a call on whether there is a, there is a, a danger to a child or a threat to life, should we not also be able to have that conversation? Um, as part of voluntary disclosure rather than having to go through MLA. And I, you know, just as you're uncomfortable about voluntary disclosure, it would make me very uncomfortable to not be able to investigate crimes like that in a way that was done efficiently. And I think I would be, you know, I would be um, serving the British public in a way that I signed up to do if I couldn't do that. I mean, in a dream world, MLA would take a week and we'd be wrapped up, right? Like, that'd be fantastic. I think we're all for due process when it works and when it's actually effective. When it's due. Hi, uh, my name is Bert van der Schappel. I'm the director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Project. A few, a few uh, touches of color on this impressionist painting because we're touching on a certain number of, of, of issues, as is naturally uh, the fact. One, even if we stay within the framework of, of the MLAT system, the fact is, as was said during the early presentations, this has been developed in an environment where the interactions between people across borders were relatively rare. I mean, it was an exception. There was a, people traveling, the guy was getting into another place. Nothing to do with the intensity and the number of absolute daily interactions. So the fact that it is slow is also related Another problem is the fact that it is dealing with a quantity of small interactions, whereas in the past it was really a government-to-government -government type of interaction on a few cases. So there was also something that was discussed yesterday, which is the amount of resources that are available in, in, to address and treat those things. But beyond that, there are, there are a few other elements. One, one thing that is striking is <clears throat> there's a sort of a conundrum or tension here between, on the one hand, the legitimate desire expressed by the companies to say, wait a minute, even if it has checked all the boxes through the MLATs, like if, if it comes to you with an order, say, give the data, it has gone through the district attorney, the FBI, the district court, and still the companies feel that there might be cases where the information may allow them, because of other information, to say this. But when you think about it, and in terms of due process, it's fascinating because if there are due process boxes that have been ticked, it is in this process because it has been ticked in one country and then in the US. And still, there is the situation where the company feels that there is a benefit for the user to have more information and make a judgment. So we're in this irony position where not only is the problem that you raised, which is irrespective of this kind of due process, there are making more and more determinations. But even when the due process has been followed in the traditional sense, we have a sort of sense that because more information can be coming, actually due process means more than just the national due process, which is a very strange situation. The last point I want to, I want to make, just to make the, 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 the picture simpler, <laughs> is that we're dealing here with situations where the MLAT process, even if it were absolutely perfect, deals very well with things that are 
criminal investigations mostly in the countries or among the countries where there is an MLAT. And the uh, MLAT.info site is very interesting in looking at how many agreements the United States has with how many countries. There are many who have no agreement. So it's with some countries for criminal investigations with dual incrimination. This doesn't prevent the company from being subject to requests that have nothing to do with criminal investigation, it can be content take down or, uh, or other aspects related to defamation or civil uh, torts and, and so on. And also to situations where there's not dual incrimination in the US, but there's still a problem. The perfect example that combines the two, I come from France, you all know that, uh, maybe not, but that France has for historic reasons, very strong laws regarding hate speech that make it a speech issue and a criminal issue. And I see smiling <laughs> over there because Yang <laughs> has been a pioneer in being caught into this web. This is a typical situation where MLAT system doesn't function. Even if there's an MLAT system between France and, and, and the US, and I still believe that France is relatively due process oriented still. Uh, <laughs> It doesn't work. So the question for companies is not only is the efficiency of the MLAT uh, an issue, but there is a larger picture that covers the question of how are companies, to follow your, your comments, able to follow some sort of agreed due process that is not just the due process that they determine. And, and it's a very tricky uh, issue that is in, in the process of being discussed, but I wanted to paint a, a broader picture here. We're just about out of time, but I just wanted to see if there was someone who had not yet um, had the opportunity to say something that wanted the final question or comment. Thank you. I'm from the Human Rights Center at UC Berkeley, and one of the issues we've been facing um, is dealing with institutions that have evolved after sort of this MLAT process, so it really wasn't conceptualized at the time the MLAT was created. So for example, we're doing a lot of work right now with the International Criminal Court to try and stop atrocities and have accountability for atrocities after they occur. Um, so I think just almost more of a comment or a seed that I'd love to plant for the future is this idea of, okay, well in those contexts where you can't even get these judicial notices, what are the ways in which the international community is prepared to come together and work in partnership where it's appropriate with corporations to get this high level um, stopping of these most grave crimes? Thanks, Alexa. Um, I think we're probably pretty much out of time, but I just wanted to also um, take a little bit of your say. I think um, the questions about the responsibilities that are now and the decisions being made by third parties, um, it's a really, like a, um, a really difficult question, and how do you manage those responsibilities? Because traditionally, the way that the MLAT system had evolved was that, that was, that's a government decision. They're the ones who you know, make assessments about the human rights practices or the judicial system in other countries and whether or not you will use your own judicial processes to compel um, your citizens or people in your jurisdiction to comply. And so it is, it's a really tricky issue that um, it's not just in the realm of government. There are other, it's not a totally novel situation, um, but it's certainly one where we're really feeling that pressure. And I think that um, what I would say is um, it's something where there needs to be a voice from all the different parties who have an interest in this. So definitely, obviously, there's a, a clear role for, for government in working to improve um, this and to improve their practices. The companies um, have obviously a very strong um, role to play in this. And I think from civil society and academia as well, that it, we need to be part of a very informed and pragmatic discussion because I, I don't think that it's productive to say everything needs to go through MLAT, you know, this is we can't, you know, anything else is ridiculous. You need, but you need to be able to have the intelligent, informed sorts of reasons and um, to have a good discussion about what other procedural safeguards would be in place or when is it appropriate or not appropriate um, to recognise another judicial process or those sorts of things. Um, and that's a tricky one, but I guess that's something that hopefully it seems like the discussion is is maturing a little, and we'd hope to be able to um, help that discussion continue to mature. Um, and as part of that, we've talked a lot about information, which it's, it's a little bit of a cop out when you say the answer is education and information, but it is in an area where there really has been very little information, it, it actually is quite important. So um, I would encourage, um, we hope 
to be able to be part of helping um, people who don't necessarily have a place in a box um, to understand <laughs> the system a bit, bit better and also to help the conversation within the box. Um, so on that note, I think I'd probably um, sadly have to close our session, but I wanted to thank um, Gail and Dale in particular um, for your role here and also everyone um, who yesterday and just generally when I harass people about MLATs. Um, <laughs> but feel free to harass me further. Um, <laughs> we'll keep the discussion going. Thank you. Thank you.